Hello, my name is Michelle, and you're listening to Profit is a Choice. With me today is Jacqueline Edwards. She's a writer, artist, and founder of Ochre and Beige, the blogging studio responsible for ghostwriting more than 150 blog posts and several websites in the interior design industry last year. Jacqueline has a background um, at, from Stanford University. She went to school there, and she studied design and marketing. And, you know, she also worked at a tech startup in Silicon Valley for a few years. And so she really is able to mix those two to be able to support creative entrepreneurs' profit goals with effective blogging strategies. And beyond helping them execute a solid plan, she's really found a knack for pinpointing a common theme or their why. Like, like what makes them different? Really to find their voice within a blog or a website and then helping them craft a message and then witnessing the result of getting the right message to the right client. And so it, it's just a beautiful thing to see. Today, Jacqueline and I are going to tackle the topic of blogs. We're going to talk about if they matter, are they dying, if you're writing one, how often, when, what to say, how to say it, what to do about SEO, all the good stuff. So Jacqueline's going to give us some really great insight into writing blog posts that matter and some ideas on content creation. So get ready because we're going to organize your blog. Here we go. Every day, empowered entrepreneurs are taking ownership of their company financial health and enjoying the rewards of reduced stress and more creativity. With my background as a financial software developer, owner of multiple businesses in the interior design industry, educator and speaker, I coach women in the interior design industry to increase their profits, regain ownership of their bottom line, and to have fun again in their business. Welcome to Profit is a Choice. Hey, Jacqueline, welcome to the podcast. Hi, Michelle. Thanks so much for having me. I'm excited to be here. Thanks. I'm glad to be able to have a chance to talk to you. So, Jacqueline, I, I read your bio, and so the listeners have a little bit of your information, but what I'd love for you to do is tell us just a little bit about your business today. Right. So, we're called Ochre and Beige. Um, we ghostwrite blog posts and website copy specifically for the design and home industry. So um, that is our sole focus. And we've been in, in business for about a year and a half now. Last year, we wrote over 150 blog posts, which I just counted up a few days ago and was kind of like, wow, that's a lot. <laughs> so um, yeah, so that's what we're doing and helping small businesses grow through um, having content to do content marketing. How did you come up with the name Ochre and Beige? Um, it actually kind of just came to me. I don't, I don't have a great story. I wish I did. I knew that I wanted to have a name that had color in the title because I feel like it really resonates with, um, this, this industry who is kind of wrapped up in this, this stuff all day, but ochre and beige just came to me and I was like, that sounds good. Like it, it sounds, it has a nice ring to it. I think I'll go with it and I still like it. So I guess, it, I guess there was some merit to that. Yeah. It, I mean, it's a fun name. It really is. But it's one of those that you look at and you go, okay, are those your favorite colors? Because I don't know that I've ever met anyone in my whole life who told me ochre was their favorite color. No, I think, I think I've been fascinated by that word ever since I saw it on a paint swatch when I was a kid, because my parents were always doing home projects and I was always playing with the paint swatches <laughs> so yeah. to entertain myself. Um, and I think that one just stuck with me for some reason. It is a great, a great word, right? Mm -hmm. It's, it's deep, you know, like it, there's depth to it. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good point. It's not, you know, it's not like blue, red, yellow. Yeah. I mean, there's like something there. It's nuanced. Mm -hmm, exactly. Absolutely. So you've been in business for about a year and a half now. Did you start off with this fantastic business plan and profitability plan? All written, well, out, ready to go. No. <laughs> I wish I could say yes. I think at the time um, I would have told you yes, but I defined profitability as uh, income minus expenses. So first of all, that's a terrible definition. If anyone has listened to your podcast before, then there's no way they, <laughs> they believe that. Um, but as an online online company, our expenses are almost nothing, right? You have the website, you have internet, you have um, some marketing or 
like Adobe, Dropbox, that kind of thing. But otherwise, it's not like you're running a, a brick and mortar company. So I was like, okay, I just need one client and I'm good to go, right? Right. <laughs> but, um, that's, you know, that was a little naive. And I think, and I think I also set myself up with a mindset of lack of profitability because I expected, you know, every business when they start, they have this period of growth, right? So I expected, all right, it'll take me some time to get up to the um, level that I want to be at. So of course I had some money in savings, you know, this was my like small investment, but the fact that I set it up that way was actually setting it up to grow slowly, right? If you know that you need to grow now, 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 like you make it happen. And I think I didn't have that mindset. And so um, like we've grown a lot since then, obviously, but at the beginning, I don't know, I was a little, I was a little relaxed about it and maybe not in the best way. It's almost like we're giving ourselves permission to not go after what we want Yep. because we're saying we know it's going to be slow. So we're giving ourselves almost permission to hold the reins and, and, and go slowly when mm-hmm. almost the other side of us is like, we want to build and we want to grow. And there is a fine right. line there because I sometimes have people come to me with a, a, a plan, a profitability slash business plan. And they literally act like they're going to walk out the door tomorrow and have 15 clients at, you know, a hundred thousand each, which is not what's going to happen in most cases. And so that one is almost like an overly aggressive, like not giving yourself room to grow. Mm -hmm. So there is somewhere, that's a good point. There is somewhere in the middle, but if we, if we plan to make little, we, we can actually hit that goal. (laughs) Right. Exactly. Yeah. 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 So how did you forgot to swing for the fence? How did I shift it? Um, yeah. And, and how long did it take yeah. before you went, wait a minute, why am I assuming that this is going to grow that slowly? Mm-hmm. Not, I mean, there, there's something to progressive growth, but when did you shift it to go, wait a minute, maybe this could grow faster than I've even given it credit for, if you will. Yeah, I think, I think it took about three to six months. And I think that was when I had real proof of concept. Like I had enough people coming in and enough work on my plate from a day-to-day basis that I was like, this is really something like there is something here and I should take it seriously. And so of course then I'm like, was I not taking this seriously before? But I, you know, it's, it's perspective. Right. Um, so I think, I think that was it. And it was at that point that I was like, and then I also, I had a conversation with my, uh, with one of my brothers, he, he studied uh, entrepreneurship and I was telling him that I was discouraged by the slow growth at the beginning. <laughs> and he was like, okay, well, how many blog posts are you writing per week? What are you charging? What are you paying in taxes? And he calculated it. And he was like, you're making $7 an hour. Like, Oh, <laughs> Oh, I did that to myself. So um, yeah, I mean, it, it comes back to the whole, the name of your podcast, Profit is a Choice. I had to make that choice that I wanted to be profitable and I wanted to grow as much as I could because that was what made me passionate. So funny, but I love how you have shared that you took ownership of it because, you know, I, I've also seen an opportunity where when we find out that we're making $7 an hour, I can remember mm-hmm. and I was making less than that. Heck, I was paying people to let me work with them at one point. You know, oh, wow. that's, that's, when you start making a negative at the bottom, that's how yeah. it feels like I'm paying you. I always say in my classes, it's like I'm paying you for the opportunity to serve you, which is just mm-hmm. insane. Um, yeah. But I know I'm not alone in that because I've coached others that, that had um, that. And it wasn't a, a thoughtful mindset. It wasn't one that we went into it and thought, let me work like, um, you know, like a maturity. That, that wasn't the thought. Yeah. Yeah. But when you found out that you were making the $7 an hour um, on average, mm-hmm. it's that ownership of, oh, I did this to myself, as opposed to look what that client did to me. Look what, you know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. You didn't yeah. point externally. You turned around and looked internally. And I think that is, that's something that I want to point out. Number one, it's hugely mature as a business owner to be able to do that. But number two, what we own, we can change. And and Mm -hmm. you've probably heard me say that on the podcast a thousand times. And so the fact that you said, Hey, wait, what am I doing to myself? Gave you not only permission, but it gave you the ability to affect the change that you needed to, to get the results you wanted. Right. Exactly. Yeah. And the thing is too, with, with working in this industry, everyone I'm working with is also a business owner. 
And so when you have to make those decisions, whether you're changing your services or raising your prices or um, niching down in a certain direction, they understand, you know, and I think that's, that's been kind of a blessing for me because I don't think every interior designer works with business owners that know what they're going through. Right. right. So I've been really lucky in that way to have so many understanding people and, and that makes it more rewarding to work in this industry in the first place. So how did you get into the creative expression of blogging and writing? How did you get started with that particular um, outlet, if you will, for your creativity? Yeah, so, well, I've been writing pretty much since I learned the alphabet, which I think is uh, true, actually. Um, but as far as writing as a career and writing and blogging itself, that kind of didn't start until more recently. Um, I actually studied design and communication at Stanford, so I had the background in, in design, but I didn't I didn't pursue that out of right out of college. I ended up working for a tech startup in San Francisco for a few years. And it was there that I, that I learned the power of words as far as marketing goes and sales. And, you know, we went from five people to 30 people in three years and no clients to hundreds of clients. So it was really a rewarding experience and it showed me that there was, there was power to that. And then, um, but then, of course, I'm like, I, I'm not really that passionate about tech, right? So I kind of knew that I needed a change. So I was like, what, what way can I still express um, this creativity, like you said, and, in a more helpful way and in a way that I'm more passionate about? So I was actually, <laughs> I was actually pondering this for, for a while, you know, before I took any action. And it was, it was Kate. You know Kate, Kate the Socialite. Yeah. Yeah. Um, she and I have been friends for many years and a few years ago I was in Wisconsin just visiting and we were having coffee and she was like, I was telling her my problems <laughs> and she was like, you know, the design and home industry could really use someone to write blog posts and I think you'd be perfect. And that was it. She didn't say anything else. She just planted that little seed and then, you know, we, we changed topics. But later I kind of came back to that and I was like, you know what? that is actually perfect for me because I have the foundation to be able to write about this in a positive way and actually have a passion in it so that I'm interested in what I'm writing about because that comes through when you're writing. If you're bored, the, the blog post is going to sound bored, right? Right. Um, so I was like, okay, I have the passion. And then I realized I also had a little bit of the, the startup background from watching that whole process work over a few years. And it was kind of like this moment of, of epiphany where I was like all of these different things in my life that I thought had absolutely no connection to each other came together in this business that I've created where now I'm doing something I love. I'm expressing myself through writing. I never thought I could make a career in writing. People told me I couldn't do it, but here we are. Um, and it's, it's really, it's really valuable because I see the impact it's having on small businesses and I don't know, that's validating at the end of the day. And I feel like I'm actually make a, making a difference. It's not just writing about curtains or um, colors or that kind of thing. Like at the end of the day, it's, it's supporting other small business owners who are trying to grow. And that means so much to me to be able to do that through writing. That is such a pretty way to put that. Um, you do have a good way with words. <laughs> <laughs> not usually speaking, so. <laughs> no, it really, it did. I think, I think that's great. And, you know, I have experienced a lot of the same, Jacqueline, with the fact that here I am 30 years into my career. And um, this year is 30 years since I graduated college and started my very first job. And 30 years in, I'm using much, if not all of the skills that I learned in my first 10 years in corporate, mm -hmm. along with my um, 16 years of owning a window treatment company, you know, interior design services to some degree, all the way up through the coaching and the education piece. It's like it's all come together and it fits in a way that when one part of my career started and stopped, I didn't see those connections. It's right taken me time and a lot of work and, and expertise building, if you will, to be able to really pull them together. And now I see it as this beautiful marriage of tech and creativity. 
that otherwise I would not have had. You know, if I had started in the more creative interior design side, I would have missed the 10 years of tech. And by having that, it has put me in another position. And then not only just tech, but tech in software development and in the financial space, right? Mm -hmm. It's like all these pieces come together. And that is a beautiful thing. Mm -hmm. I, I, segue just for a second. And I want to encourage the listeners, you know, especially if, let's say, the design or um, making window treatments or upholstery, whatever it is, let's say that it is your second career. I can promise you almost every single time we can find something from your first career that has allowed you to have a different viewpoint, a different way of doing things, or even just a broadened and deepened experience now. And so, um, you know, we don't want to miss that. That's, I think that's the beauty of, of having a business that we own is it brings all of us to the table and you have done that just mm -hmm. in a really great way. And to find it out so early is amazing. I feel super lucky. I know, I know people spend a long time searching for the career that, that really blends everything they love together. So super lucky. And doesn't it feel like it feels really good too, which I don't, I didn't, maybe I didn't expect that. Maybe I just expected it would feel like work, but it feels really good to be able to do something like that. Yeah. I, you know, I, I do think that work can be hard, but I don't think it always has to be hard all day, every day in every moment. Mm -hmm. And I think sometimes that's how we can maybe not understand the full value of what we're doing because there's a piece and a part of it that comes with ease or there's a, a piece and part of it that we bring, that brings us joy and makes us feel fulfilled. And, and I think sometimes we don't know what to do with that. And so we almost look at it as this guilty thing Interior designers, we all do this in creative industries. I've se I see it across the board, artists everywhere. It's almost like I'm loving this, enjoying this, expressing myself, creating. I almost shouldn't charge you for it, mm. right? Which we know is yeah. not true. I just have to pay my bills. But there's this feeling of it's got to be work and hard and difficult, and then I've earned the right to charge. And, and it, it's twisted. Yeah, and I think... I think it's interesting that you mentioned that because I was just thinking today, I have, I have this problem where I will not take time for myself. I will literally work when I wake up till when I go to sleep. And I'm not upset about that, but at the end of the day, I'm like, hmm, you know, I probably could have taken 30 minutes to go, to a, to go for a run, you know? It, it wasn't necessary, but I'm doing it because I enjoy doing it. But I also think that when we're busy, we have this relationship between being busy and being successful. And so I kind of ask myself, am I telling myself that I am this busy and unable to take 30 minutes to either eat lunch or go do something active because I think that makes me more successful? Or is that just um, because I'm enjoying what I'm doing, right? Right, so yeah. You have to balance things, which is really interesting. Yeah, it's almost like the pride of busyness. Yeah. <laughs> that, you know, I know that sounds kind of weird, but it is. Sometimes we take pride in, well, I must be successful if I'm this busy. Let me tell you how busy I am versus mm -hmm. this idea that we're not as successful if we took an hour to go to the gym during the day, or like you said, we stopped and had lunch or walked the dogs or like mm -hmm. that somehow makes us less successful. When I would tell you that most of us are craving that and mm -hmm. would say, wow, the fact that you have the opportunity to do that and still make, you know, whatever money you need to make to keep your life and business running is amazing. And so we, we get trapped in this idea that more, 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 more um, is going to satisfy. And it doesn't, it doesn't satisfy yeah. at some point. It's almost like, I don't, I don't care how much more money comes in. I got to take a break. I know I'm getting ready to, um, and I can't, it, it may come out prior to this, but I've hired a personal trainer and I've got to tell you the fact that I have to set up an appointment with her and I have to get out of my house and go see her. It, at first it almost felt like, like I was giving myself something that was seemed over the top. And mm -hmm. now I'm only about, I guess this is my second weekend and it feels like such a necessity because it's waking up my muscles and it's making my body move that um, in a way that I have kind of shut down by sitting in a chair too long working. And it, it now almost feels like a lifeline to me where at first it felt like, you know, maybe an over the top kind of 
you know, you, you, you should be thankful. Now I'm almost like, Oh my goodness, how did I ever live mm-hmm. without this? And I'm not one who enjoys all that kind of stuff. <laughs> I, just am not, I mean, I enjoy moving. I enjoy activity, but I'm not one who, who likes to just go work out at the gym, but working with her as a personal trainer and her assessing my needs and working with me and, and working to help me just make sure that my personal health is where it needs to be. Mm-hmm. It's now become a lifeline, right? Yeah. Yeah. And it's interesting because that is the exact same reason why people hire business coaches, right? Yeah. But you're doing it for your health instead of the health of your company. Right. That's exactly <laughs> so good for you. Oh, right. Which is exactly what my blog posts are going to be coming out about because yeah. the first thing that she said to me when we spoke was, um, you know, Michelle, from sitting as long as you've been sitting, I've been having some problems with my lower back and all this and my shoulders and stuff. She said, we really need to work on your core because if your foundation Mm -hmm. isn't solid, now what's the first module in my better business coaching system, the solid (laughs) foundation. So I just started laughing and I'm like, okay, so pretty much you're telling me everything about my body that I tell everybody about their business. But she had me at that moment. And I'm like, I have to listen to you. If I expect others to listen to me about their business and I'm telling them the same foundational things, I need to listen to her. And, and I did, I immediately gave up control of what I thought I knew and just said, just tell me, just, just help me, tell me the same thing that I, you know, that my, I love when my clients say to me is here's what I do know, but just help me and tell me and and direct me. And, Mm -hmm. um, and it does. Then, then I go back to like you and I spoke even before we came on, you're, you're, we're sharing that you're having a lot of creative energy and these bursts of excitement in your business. And I really think adding that time for a little bit of self care in there allows us to be creative and excited again when it can start to get drained because our bodies and our minds are extremely tired from overwork. Mm -hmm. I completely agree. Completely. So you started blogging, writing when you started doing it on your own and you immediately kind of niched with interior designers and staging window coverings, the home industry. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that, Tell me your thoughts on blogging. I mean, seriously, you do it for business. So, of course, you think it's important. But why is it that we keep hearing that blogs are dying? And then on the next hand, we hear, no, you've got to blog. You've got to yeah. do it. Where, where's the truth in all that? Just, like, tell us the truth here, Jack. Yeah. I think, I think the reason people say blogging is dying is because video is taking such a center stage right now. But the thing with video, especially if you're doing it on – Um, like Facebook Live, for example, if you are able to take those videos and put them on your website, that's fantastic. But otherwise, those people that are seeing it on these social media sites are not going to your site, right? I mean, maybe you can compel them to, but you don't really own that user until they sign up for your newsletter and you get their email address or they become regular traffic to your site because they're coming back for a certain reason, like a blog, for example. Um, So I think. I think it's really hard to say that blogging is dying when blogging is something that's, that's giving you access to so many people. And really the way, the way I see it working and the, it's actually kind of fascinating that blogging is still around because it's old, like for technology, it's pretty old. It's been around for 10 years. Um, but I think in the last few years, it has, it is actually seeing its heyday as far as um, supporting businesses. But because before when it started, it was mostly, um, individuals blogging about either traveling or cooking or, or whatever it happened to be. But now businesses are using it to spread content um, and then draw people back into their site. So when you have a blog, you can use it as this foundation that literally everything else that you do for your marketing can be structured around. So you can post on social media to get people to go read the post on your, on your website. You can put it in your newsletter so that people go from the newsletter in their inbox to your website. Um, there was a, there was another one I can't remember, but, um, basically any, any marketing that you're doing, you can involve your blog content and hopefully you're writing about something that's, that's valuable to your target client. That's interesting to them or, um, somehow helping them with the struggles that they face that way when they go to your site and they get this helpful content, they start looking at other helpful content or they sign up for your newsletter. And so it's kind of this this thing that feeds into itself um, and just supports your business, right? Because I think at the end of the day, 
what you want most from someone new who is coming to your site, who is your target client, is to get them to sign up for your newsletter because that is a warm lead that you are now in touch with intimately through their inbox. So blogging can help do that. And um, gosh, that's just one of the ways um, that I think blogging is important. The other is being a person. You were actually talking about this um, on the podcast, the visibility one with uh, Rachel Moriarty. Yes. Um, and she was saying being, being personable, talking about yourself, like um, that kind of thing is something you can do in a blog. On your, in your website copy, which I write a little bit of website copy. I don't actually design the sites, just the, the words. Um, but that, that's something where you're attracting your target client, but you're not necessarily talking about yourself that much. Um, but in the blog, you can. If you're doing it in a positive way, you can. And it helps people identify with you and see you as someone that's, that's real and not just this... Um, I don't know. Cor corporate identity. Yeah, yeah, exactly. This faceless business. Um, so that's, that's another way it's super helpful for, for businesses, especially small businesses that are trying to get um, like clients that are local to them on a national scale. It's harder, right? Because you have more competition, but um, when you're just talking to people in your area, you, you can get really, really personal. And I think that's really cool. It's interesting that you say that I have, um, you know, a lot of times when people call me and they want to interview me and I'm interviewing them, of course, to see if we can work together um, as coach and coachee, sometimes they'll say to me, I already know I want to work with you. And I'm like, okay, mm -hmm. how do you know that you want to work with me? You're like, this is our first mm -hmm. time ever speaking. How do you know that? And I'll hear, well, I've heard your podcast and I've read your blog post and I feel like I know you or you're talking yeah. to me, yep. speaking to me. And what I love about that is, number one, they hear my voice, right? Mm -hmm. Because I'm not going to put something out there that's, that doesn't represent what I think and feel and say. And I also try to be careful with that because it is a platform, right? So to be careful um, how I handle that information. But then people get a sense of who I am, what I think, how I work. And it, I'm, I'm sure that there's probably some that it repels, but there mm -hmm. are some that it absolutely draws in. and so they become almost hot leads without me doing anything other than saying, have you looked at my blog? I mean, sometimes I don't even have to say it, right? They've already done it. But mm -hmm. quite often I'll say to somebody that's trying to check me out or that's comparing maybe what I do and how I do it with another business coach, um, which is fine. There are lots of business coaches out there. There are very few who do what I, I don't know of any really who do what I do on the financial side. I think I'm the only one who does that the way that I do it. But there are certainly, if you're talking general coaching, there, there are other um, coaches out there in the interior design industry that, mm -hmm. that can coach on those same things. And I just say, go read the blogs, go listen to the podcast and see what resonates. You know, talk to them, of course, interview anybody and then choose the person that you feel most closely connected to because you're going to have a really great relationship. Yeah. But yeah. I've always been surprised. And then the other thing that's happened is people <laughs> they and you've we've probably all had this happen before they act like they know you so because they've seen you on Facebook they've seen you in your newsletters they've seen you in a blog post and when I say seen I've got you know air quotes around all that but they've had access to your ideas and your thoughts and opinions in a myriad of ways and then when they meet you they're like oh I know you it's like when they've read your book mm -hmm. and then I remember when you did this and I remember when you did that yeah and you're yeah. going, I have no clue who you are, <laughs> but you know yeah. everything about me. Yeah. yeah. But it's I fun. Had a, it is fun. I had, one, I had one client that I talked to on the phone, or a potential client at the time, and she was like, I heard you on, on Kate's podcast, and I just love you. And I was like, oh, my gosh. <laughs> that's, a really, that's a really powerful. <laughs> you know, you yeah. want to say I love you, too, but I don't know you. <laughs> that's all right. That's right. And then sometimes you're thinking, oh, goodness, what did I say in that blog post that got, yeah, you know, where sometimes they'll, they'll say, I heard you on this and I saw you on that. And I'm thinking, I do so much of that. I don't even know what, what it is you heard. I hope it was good. I, I hope that, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that it was yeah. a good thing. 
Yeah. So I, thing too, you mentioned, you mentioned maybe you repel some people. I actually think it's good if you repel some people, because if, if you are that, those aren't your target clients, right? If, if I'm writing my blog post in this really happy voice because I'm an energetic person and someone doesn't resonate with them, I probably don't want to work with them anyway, right? Oh yeah. I, I um, call that self-editing. They just self-edited themselves out. Yeah. And I don't now have to do it, right? Because nobody right. wants to say to somebody, hey, I don't want to work with you. I mean, that, I don't think that most people get joy out of that conversation or I'm not right for you, our services don't align or whatever. We do it because we have to do it, but I don't think anybody really takes joy in that. And if they do, you know, that's a whole yeah. other thing. <laughs> and so for somebody to read our copy, whether it is in an ad, in a blog, you know, on our website, in our pricing structure, and if they self edit, it keeps me from having to edit. And um, I, I do, I don't think that is a bad thing at all. I know one time early on, probably about four or five years ago, um, I was having one of those moments where somebody had said that there was this new person who was kind of stepping in trying, she had taken some of my content, was trying to do some of the same things that I was doing. And I was, I was kind of shocked and I was like, oh my gosh, what does this mean to my business? You know, she's taken some of, of like the exact wording, the exact mm -hmm. certifications, like she was really um, mm -hmm. modeling, I'm going to say. <laughs> Nicely. Nice yeah, of you. Trying to be kind. <laughs> she was modeling after everything that I was doing. And some people, and, and her price point was a lot lower. And so a lot of people were looking at it. And I had a very wise friend say to me about Michelle, her personality is not yours. Her delivery is not yours. She doesn't have the knowledge in the background. She just has the copy. So at some point, it's going to show up. You know what I mean? And the people yep. that are drawn to that are not going to be your people. And I mean, she's not even around anymore, you know? And so I, I was just like, I had to take a step back and go, right. If they're drawn to that, they would not be my client. Right. And then that, yeah. that brought a lot of peace. So I do think the blogging and um, all of that is great. One thing I heard one time too, like I, I have worked with a stylist before who came into my closet and it was helping me edit my clothes and go through mm -hmm. all of that. And she really encouraged me that um, any piece of clothing that I purchased, I needed to be able to wear it three ways. Right. So unless it was just this one time crazy thing, like, I don't know, bridesmaids dress that they swear you'll wear again, you know, you never will. <laughs> uh, right. But right. Any, any normal piece of clothing that I might buy, I needed to be able to wear it and style it three different ways. And I would suggest and, and love to get your opinion that our blog post can be used more than once. I mean, the goal here is not to have to keep creating all this new content without reusing it in some effective manner. Can you speak to how um, a really great blog post could be used more than once, kind of like the three times rule or 10 times yeah. rule or whatever it is. You've already mentioned one where you said it could be put into our newsletter. Mm -hmm. you know, so then it provides newsletter content, but what are some other ways and do you think that's important? Yeah, I, I definitely think it's important. Um, with social media, I think it's, it's natural to post on social media once to drive traffic to the blog post and then forget about it. But you can, you can post every day about content that's on your blog. Um, even the same post three times in a week and just pull out a different, a different quote from the post or write a different little caption for it. Um, so then all of a sudden you are becoming more active on social media and you're having um, more of a, an impact on, on the people that are seeing your posts. And hopefully driving traffic so that was one post and you can get two weeks three weeks keep going month out of it um, I mean obviously you're not posting the same thing a hundred times you're you're mixing up the what you're writing about it or the photo um, but it's the same content right you're reusing that content over and over again um, the other other way is you can mention it within videos so if you are doing a Facebook live or any kind of video um, mention the blog post that you just wrote, talk about why you're excited about it, what it's going to um, provide to people and get them to go over to your website. So really, I mean, we talk about reusing it, but anything that you're doing as far as marketing, you can talk about your blog and try to drive traffic over. So um, yeah, I mean, 
newsletter, social media. That's uh, so the three term rule yeah. is not a bad rule. I mean, think yeah. of multiple ways because if we think about, I think when we blog, if we think about how can we use this in a multitude of ways, it does also impact the way that we might write it. Mm hmm. Right. Um, you know, another way that I've used some of my blog posts and some of the even the videos that I've done, Facebook videos or whatever lives is I have used them in my education. So instead of redoing it, you know, like if I'm teaching a course, I might have to decide, hey, go check out this blog post for more information or go look at this Facebook live. And, yeah. um, you know, and, and so then I'm even able to even reuse it. And so for the interior design industry, that's huge because let's say they wrote a blog post. They could then, when they are doing part of their presentations to their clients, that mm -hmm. could be part of a welcome packet or part of a, an yeah. educational packet to say, hey, I wrote about what you could expect to pay or how to hire a good interior designer or mm -hmm. what sets my design firm apart, you know, whatever it is that they blogged about at some point, they can take that information and reuse it just even in the education or in the sales process. And I think yeah. sometimes we forget that and think we have to stop. Like I've caught myself um, when someone asked me a question, I've caught myself instead of sending them to a landing page that I already have or sending them to a blog post that I've already written, almost feeling like I need to in that moment stop and rewrite it. Well, number one, it's, it's a waste of my time, right? If I've already documented it and put it out there, but number two, I'm missing an opportunity to send someone where they need to go to get all the information in case I forget to write something. Mm -hmm. So it really is just a great thing to be able to send them back over there to get that information. Yeah. And I actually have several clients that are using the blog. Um, one of their categories uh, for topic for content is like a client corner, or client nook, that kind of thing where they just are publishing um, content that's interesting to someone who is actually working with them, whether it's how does a consultation work? How can you make the most of it? Um, what does a realistic budget look like? Um, what can you expect from scope? That kind of thing. So these are, these are very specific and they're able to put this on the blog. They can do marketing around it and they can also, when they're talking to clients, say, Hey, go on over here to this category. And now you have all of this information that we're going to be going through together. So it's really, it's really, really neat that you said that because I think it goes, it goes both ways. It's not only in telling the client that you have um, these blog posts that they might be interested in, but also making blog posts that the clients will need, right? So that brings up a good point that, you know, for example, sometimes in the past, social media may have been like something that we just did. And I'm, I'm, I know that we don't really consider blogging social media, but in a way it really is to me. Um, but you own it. Yeah. We're being social it. and it's media. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. But like, like for example, Instagram stories, those are usually not that they're not planned out, but they're a little more off the cuff in the moment, put it mm -hmm. out there. And I have seen, I think one of the things that can be damaging is when a blog post feels like it's in the moment, just stick it out there versus mm -hmm part of an overall plan and the way that you've described blogs today should make us stop and think this needs to be part of an overall business slash marketing slash financial strategy so that we are careful with the content. We're careful with what we write, how we write it, where we point them to, do we have a call to action? How can I use it more than once? Mm -hmm. And so, you know, when we come into it with a little bit more of a structure in some ways, you know, some people might go, oh my gosh, that feels so limiting, but it actually opens us up to so much more opportunity yeah. when it happens that way. Yeah. And the thing is, I think, I think we forget, or maybe it's just because of the way blogging initially started, but it's like you said about the strategy. One, there's a strategy behind the content and making sure that it's valuable to your target client. But two, it should also be supporting your business goals. And I don't just mean the short term ones of getting more people in your newsletter, but even let's say, let's say in the next year you want to open a store, right? So before you even get to that, you should be publishing content that is showing your taste in items or showing some of the ideas that you have. That way, when you're launching this new thing that you want to do, people are already excited about it and they're already, you know, in on your aesthetic and you have a, an audience for that, right? So it's really, whenever I do a planning session with, um, with clients, we always talk about their business goals because you always want your blog supporting what you're doing with the business itself. 
Great reminder. So how consistent do we need to be? I mean, I know, you know, we, if we don't have it as part of a strategy and we're not really, or even if we do and we mm -hmm. get busy or we get whatever, it's easy to throw one up. Even if we said we were going to like, uh, let me back up. I've seen people say, Oh, I'm going to blog every week. That's four mm -hmm. blog posts a month. That's a lot of blogging. Okay. Mm -hmm. I think that's a lot of blogging. Not that you can't do it, but it takes a lot of time to do that. We'll talk about that in a minute, but and then they go, oh, well, I missed a week, so I did it three times. And oh, well, snap, this month's busy. I'm going to do it once. And then they have three months that they don't blog at all. So there's this inconsistency yeah. that I think is damaging. What, what do you think is about consistency and how much is enough and how much is not enough? Like what are the boundaries there or yeah. parameters that are good? I think it's better to pick a middle ground and be consistent than to shoot for the moon and not be consistent. Um, because the thing with consistency is that you're creating a pattern of behavior, right? So I know that Michelle's podcast comes out every Monday and I download it and I listen to it on my Monday morning walk to the cafe. So that is how your podcast has been kind of put into my life. So if you are doing this, if someone is doing the same thing with their blog or trying to, and you post it on a Monday this time, and then maybe, maybe a Wednesday, and then you skip a few weeks and then people don't know what to expect from you and they can't come back to look for the content if they don't think that it will be there. Right. So I think consistency is actually huge. And I would rather see someone consistently post at the beginning of every month once than try to post, um, one time a week and be all over the board. I think, I think they would find more success with that. So the sweet spot, I would say, if you're looking for, for a number, I really think that one post per month is, is kind of bare minimum. It helps with SEO and you can use it as part of your overall strategy. I think twice per month is the sweet spot for most people who are doing it themselves. Um, and you can really, you can get so much marketing content out of, out of two posts. Um, if you can do it once a week, fantastic. I know there are some bloggers like, um, Studio McGee or Emily Henderson that are blogging every day. And I think that's setting a really unrealistic standard for smaller businesses who don't have a full marketing team behind them. So for anyone who is getting overwhelmed by thinking that they have to blog, 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 you're not a blogger, you're a designer, and you do have something positive to share in a blog, um, but you don't need to make yourself crazy to, to make it happen. Just approach it from what you can do and do consistently. So I think that's, that's probably how much is enough for someone. Um, I think that's great. I blog probably twice a month. This, well, not probably, I do. I, I have one <laughs> newsletter article and I have two blog posts a month. And I, in general, I try to have my newsletter come out um, around the very first of the month. Sometimes it varies. It might be the third or the fourth, you know, based mm -hmm. on the beginning of the week kind of thing. Right. And then for the two weeks after that, I have a blog post each week that comes out. And then I go back and have another newsletter. And I, I, in my strategy, I don't know if it's right or wrong, but it's what I've been doing for the last probably almost a year now. Um, my newsletter is the first part of what I'm talking about. And then I continue the conversation in the blog. They're all standalone, right? So if you just read one, you would certainly get everything out of it. But I have my newsletter and the two blog posts for that month. They're around the same topic. They're around an idea that I'm trying to get across. Yeah. And then the next month, the newsletter article and the two blog posts are another idea that I'm trying or a nuance mm -hmm. of, of the idea that I'm trying to get across. And I have found for me that makes it a little bit easier because then I feel like when I, when I'm doing it, I say, here's what I want to talk about. This is good. This part goes in the newsletter and these two are the blog posts. And then it helps me get the words out and get the ideas out because I mm -hmm. feel like they're strung together. There's a, they're, they're, and I don't feel like I'm having to like jump all over the place every yeah. time I write a blog post. And so there's like this idea that I need to fully develop. And I just give myself three opportunities to work out that idea. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, I, so I think it's, I think what you're doing is perfect and that you're kind of having all of them around the same idea. Um, I'd be super curious to see 
what the difference is between having the newsletter come first and then the blog posts versus the other way around. Because I actually do it the other way around because I want, when my newsletter comes out, I want people to click over to the blog if they haven't yet. Um, but again, you know, that's not to say that um, having the newsletter come out first and giving them that, you know, you're, you're basically priming them with this, with this topic that you're talking about to then click on your blog post later when they see it. So I think it's, it's really, I'd be really interested to kind of test that out maybe on my own and see, and see yeah. what happens. And you'll yeah. have to let me know if it works the opposite. Yeah. Shoot I'm me gonna, I'm I'll gonna switch experiment. it up. <laughs> <laughs> I'll switch it up. Yeah. Um, but, but, you know, just even, even just having the strategy, because I remember when I was blogging years ago before, you know, my latest kind of, I, I had to take a hiatus simply because I couldn't figure out what to say, when to say it, how to say it. And it's not that I, like you said, it's not that I didn't have something to share. I didn't have a strategy and just how important the strategy is and was for me to even think about it. Do you know what I mean? It's like yeah. I, everything felt like I was having to come up with some original content. And yeah. for me, because I create education and I do speaking engagements, I literally felt like I was so content driven that I was like, I'm out of words. I don't, which my husband would love to hear that, wouldn't he? <laughs> <laughs> oh, honey, I'm sorry. I'm out of words today. He'd be uh -huh. like, <laughs> <laughs> bless him. But I kept thinking, what else can I say? Like, how many ways can I say it? Yeah. And, and so it's truly putting a strategy of an idea of what I want to say, what I want to put out, what I want to talk about. It, it really freed me up to find the words mm -hmm. again. And I think also people, part of the, the struggle in even writing a blog post is, okay, now I have to think up a topic. But if you have it already planned out in advance, you believe that you have created a you know, sequence of content that makes sense to your target client. When you go to sit down to write the post, you don't have to, to start getting creative, right? You already have your idea. You're like, okay, I know what I'm writing about. I can just dive in. Um, and I think the other thing, people maybe put a lot of pressure on themselves to be perfect, but you can really write like you speak and just have someone edit it for the, the grammar and spelling. But if you say y'all in real life, go ahead and write it. You don't need to, to write an English essay. Um, <laughs> That's a good point because we're showing yeah. part of our personality and our business personality. Mm hmm. Exactly. Exactly. So how long does it typically take you to research and write blogs or, or, or do you also see other people doing? Because there is for most of us, I would submit it's not a quick 10 minute process. No. Um, and I, I'll actually tell you how much I spend on clients' posts and how much I spend on my own, because I think that will interest you. Um, for clients' posts, I usually spend three to four hours, and researching actually doesn't, doesn't take that much, not nearly as much as it did in the beginning because I have a grasp on the industry, but, um, and I usually request that clients send over five bullet points on the topic so that I can kind of get inside their head and not um, try to be a mind reader because I can't do that. <laughs> um, and then... Writing usually takes two hours, and then if there are any edits, that's a little bit of more time. And then formatting in either Squarespace or WordPress actually takes more time than you would think because I do all those little SEO things like changing the image titles and um, writing the right keywords and that kind of thing. For my own posts, I'm not even kidding, it takes me eight hours because I'm so indecisive when it comes to myself. When it, comes, when it comes to other clients, I'm like, okay, I know your brand, I know your voice, I know your topic, I have your, your five thoughts, I have all of your photos, and I can just, you know, sit down and do it. When it comes to mine, I'm like, oh my gosh, this has to be perfect, um, I have to wow them, and I put all of these, I don't know, expectations or pressure on myself, because it's my occupation, right? If I'm not, if I'm not publishing good blog posts of my own, why would anyone hire me? And so... I mentioned that because I think when it comes to writing your own blog, I can tell you it takes me three hours to write someone else's. But when it comes to writing your own, I think you have to maybe come to terms with the fact that it doesn't need to be this huge, amazing thing that you've been envisioning all day. You can just 
write it. And it's good, like it's, it's really good enough. If it's you, if it's providing value, if it has nice photos, it's really good enough. That's a good point. Um, I know it's almost like when we are designing our own home, if we're a designer and we exactly. get stuck because there's, well, I could do this and then I could do that. And what about that? And what are other people going to think? I had a designer recently tell me that, um, that she almost felt embarrassed to have other designers come to her home because she knew that they were going, that they had ex potentially that they could have expectations because she was a designer. Mm -hmm. And in the window treatment world, we used to always laugh that many of us maybe didn't have window treatments in our own home because we were too busy <laughs> doing it for everybody else, right? Exactly. Yep. Um, yep. And, and so there, there, I do think that is a thread that kind of runs through all of us. Um, and yours is, you're right, you're the one who's out there selling the service. You need to make sure that your own looks sellable. It was like right. I told somebody the other day, I went when I joined the, the gym that we joined a couple of years ago, I went in and the guy that was a sales rep at, at one of the desks over was overweight eating a cheeseburger, French fries and a milkshake while he was trying to sell me a gym membership. And I was <laughs> shaking my head. Like I, I, I don't see how these things mix. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yep. I, it would have mixed if he would have just not been eating the, I can handle <laughs> the hamburger I would have removed the bun, but the fries and the milkshake threw me. I just, <laughs> I was like, oh my God. Extra mile. <laughs> right? So if your blog post was like horrible and, and you were trying to sell it, people would be like, what? If you had misspellings and pictures that didn't, you know, convey the message that you're trying, they would be like, something's not like the other here. This is yeah. odd. And so yeah. I, I get that. But I think that's also why sometimes having a second person look at it or even give us just that freedom to just do what you need to do and keep moving. Mm -hmm. That's not your full-time job. So don't get so hung up on it. Yeah, exactly. Yep. Now you mentioned when you are doing the SEO and you're working through it and especially when you go to do the Squarespace and the WordPress that you are paying attention to some of these SEO opportunities. Tell us a little bit about what are some of the things that you look at for those that are writing their own blogs, just, you know, for them to, to be aware of that they need to consider. Yeah. So I think, I think SEO ends up being really scary for some people. And especially if you go, you know, Google it online, you are going to be extremely overwhelmed because most things are written very technical. Um, so my advice for someone that does not have a lot of time to pay attention to this is to really focus on your the value of your content because if you're picking a topic that is very relevant to your target client, that is already checking off one box in the SEO category. Um, the other things that you can do that are that are small and won't um, kill too much time is to relabel your images in a way that include whether you're an interior design firm, workroom, etc. What the picture is of your location. Um, I actually have a, a three three part blog post on my website that people can check out that takes you through this in a hopefully not technical way. Um, and I give you an example of what you can label the images as. Like there's a really simple formula. It's like your business name, location, um, what the picture is about, or even what the post is about. If you think the picture, um, if it's like red house, maybe you don't want to put red house. Maybe you want to put, um, how to pick colors, that kind of thing. Um, and then as far as headlines go, and I, hopefully that word won't make anyone panic, but when you write your blog post, um, you want to split it up into sections. So you should do that really anyway, just for readability. But when you split it up into sections, it gives you the opportunity to create headlines for that section. And when you're formatting those headlines in WordPress or Squarespace, you can make them um, a bigger size. And those are usually labeled as H2 or H3. Um, and the reason that's important is because when Google or a search engine is going through your page, it looks at the big, the big font first because it believes those are the big ideas. So that's the first thing that your website is being categorized as. Um, I really, I really go through it's It's really, it's really a dense topic. Um, but I think, I think I would just say for someone who is doing this on their own, that might not have a lot of time, focus on your 
content being highly specific to your target client, relabel images and have headlines. And that's, I would that's just stop a lot there. Of it right there though, right? Yeah. I would just stop there. Yeah. Okay. And so what do you see is the biggest problem if we're not maintaining the blog or if we're writing it and we're not even considering SEO or it's just kind of a, an afterthought to our business? Well, yeah. Do you think that causes more damage than if we just didn't do it? Um, I don't know if it causes active damage, but it certainly doesn't, doesn't help. Um, and something else I want to mention with SEO, when you are updating your website uh, consistently, then Google will rank your site as an active site. So if you haven't published a blog post or changed anything on your website in six months, Google might think that you're no longer an active business. So it actually helps in that way as well. Um, so I guess, I guess that would be an active way. It could hurt you if you're not um, updating anything, updating the site. Yeah. I think that's probably the one way it would, it would hurt you. Um, and I think just driving website traffic, because if you're posting on social media um, and you're trying to drive website traffic, if you think about what's on your website, it's your services, your portfolio, and maybe your about, about page. But if you don't have other content for people to read, then you're just talking about those three things all of the time. And that's really more self-promotion than it is providing something that could help. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, so let me ask this question. Is there a good rule of thumb for how much education to provide in a blog insight to provide versus, um, you know, maybe a call to action. I mean, I've always heard you have, mm -hmm. you need to have some call to action, even if it's just sign up for the newsletter. I mean, it doesn't have to be a costly call to action. Right. But we almost need to give them somewhere to go next. But, mm -hmm. but when it comes to the content itself, how much of it should be educational slash um, inspirational slash salesy? So the way, what I typically suggest, and you don't have to follow this to the T, um, but I usually suggest that 35% be um, more advice, problem solving, how to's, that kind of thing. 35% can be projects. So you can either just show the before and afters, just the afters, or you can actually dive into the details of the project. Um, if you think that your target client would be interesting, interested in seeing how it came together. Um, so that makes up 70%, right? Advice and projects, 70%. So the rest of the, the last 30, I have that broken down into 20% inspiration. So this can be um, trends, fun things you find, um, highlighting someone in the industry who's doing cool things or making cool things, um, or product roundups, people like to do those. So that can be 20%, because if you just do inspiration 100% of the time, then I have a feeling you're, you're going to get a superficial target client and not someone who's actually interested in hiring you. Um, and then that last 10% I leave for personal and company news. So any events you're hosting or um, updates to services, that kind of thing, that's really just specific to your business. So that's kind of okay. how, that's how I break it down. And I think over what time frame? So is this like the percentage that you use over the over whole year? year? Yeah. Per I use it over a year. Yeah. Okay. So, okay. So, and do you try to balance that per quarter? Yeah. Yeah, I do. I try. Okay. Yeah. It depends on, it depends on how many posts you're writing per month. So yeah. Sure. Yeah. Sure. 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 But it, at least two a month, it should be able to be balanced over a quarter. Right, exactly. Yep. Yeah. Okay. And the thing is when you start, so I actually have um, a planning guide that people can download and um, brainstorm ideas right in there. And it has these percentages as well. So you can see what um, the breakdown would look like with, with your ideas. And um, I think by default, if you are coming up with ideas that are specific to your target client, it will actually end up falling into these percentages. Okay. So it becomes very organic. Yeah, exactly. 
Jacqueline, what is something that you would offer as advice to those in um, the interior or home industry that are looking to either start blogging, be more consistent with blogging? What What would you just if you if you could offer them something, what would it be? Yeah. To um, I would encourage you to just do the do what you can do. Don't try to, um, like I said, shoot for the moon because in the end, if you don't succeed, then it's more discouraging than actually just doing one post a month and being content with that. Um, but I really think that just even just doing one post a month, it gives you content to structure the rest of your marketing around, and that will create profitability in the long term. Um, it's like it's exactly like you and Rachel were talking about in the visibility podcast. It's a long game. You might not see something right away, but don't let that discourage you. It's really about being visible and getting people to come to your site because you own that site, right? The followers you have on social media, I mean, Facebook or Instagram, they can change their algorithm and you just never know. So I think it's really important to have that place where people know you and people are becoming your um, your users, for lack of a better word, whether it's just in traffic or in signing up for your newsletter because that's where profitability comes from long-term. That, that's a great point. It's almost like thinking of our website as, um, I, I just did a blog, or a, sorry, not a blog, not blogs online. <laughs> I just did a podcast with um, Nicole Heimer, and she calls it your digital destination. Mm -hmm. and, and I think if you think about it, it's like our digital store. They are coming in to shop with us or to see what we have and to browse our offerings. And we need to take that seriously because like you said, there are clients when they come in in some way, mm -hmm. shape or form, even if it's just to look. And I know there are stores that I've gone in and looked at, you know, for months or a year before I ever purchased. Yeah. And there are people that do the same to us. They come to our blog post and our website and they're there for a while until they either the offering is what they need. They're in a place that they can afford it or they need it or whatever, but they there, that doesn't mean they're not coming to look and to mm -hmm. browse. Yep. And you want to leave them with the, with a, the right impression for, for you, not necessarily for them, but for your target client. So maybe the person window shopping isn't your target client. That's okay. Um, but that's, that's part of profitability is making sure that you're speaking to the person that you want to hire you eventually. Jacqueline, what's one of the next profit goals in your business? What are you looking to do next? Um, I, so, so we, everything we do is custom. Um, and I, I kind of liken it to an interior, an interior designer. So right now what I'm doing would be the same thing as someone designing an entire home. Um, and I see this need for kind of the, the middle, the middle tier people who may not be able to afford the custom services, but they still really need this. And I want to be able to serve them. So, you know, I, I think about that as, okay, I'm just designing one room in their home. Right. Um, so I don't know what it's going to be yet, <laughs> but I am really trying to find a solution for them because I, I just know that, that there's a need there for people who can't do the custom, but want some help with the blog. Um, so I think that's probably my next step and hiring some administrative help because I don't want to do it anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Good for you. Good for you. <laughs> so Jacqueline, where can people find you? I know you have set up a landing page for my listeners. Tell them about that and what they can find at that um, site. So they can go to ochreandbeige.com and ochre is spelled O-C-H-R-E kind of a, an English spelling there. Um, and there you will find a download for the planning strategy guide that I mentioned that will take you through the process of going from, um, you know, coming up with the ideas, deciding what's going on in the context of time, whether maybe you're going to a high point market, for example, or you know that a lot of your target clients um, We'll get sucked into back to school season and maybe you want to you know highlight that some way so you have the ideas you have the context of time you have your business goals and then 
just structuring out a calendar of your best ideas for the quarter year, however long into the future you want. So just kind of a, a hand-holding guide to take you through that process so you're not alone in the strategy. Okay, and so I know you set up the landing page for us, so it's ochreandbage.com slash profit as a choice, yep, no right? no spaces, no dashes, just profit as a choice. Okay, perfect. Um, Jacqueline, I just want to tell you, this has been so fun. We could probably jump back on and talk about 10 more times with blogging and, and ideas and, and even how to take this content calendar and fill it out. So, you know, it, it, just don't, don't go get happy thinking I don't ever have to talk to Michelle on the podcast again. I might just have to try that. No more sleepless <laughs> nights. Actually, just kidding. Yeah, I really do. Um, I enjoy working with you. I know I've worked with you for some of my own content and you do such a beautiful job. I've recommended you quite a few times and it, I just want to say how great it feels from my perspective to have someone who understands the voice of the client um, that we're all searching for. And so I, I just want to encourage our listeners that if you don't want to write your blogs by yourself and you just, this is just not something that you want to do, you know, maybe check into Jacqueline's services. Um, I think you would be very pleased with um, any of the work that she delivers for you. So thank you for coming on and talking to us about blogs and how we should look at them and how to incorporate them in our business or to even understand how they fit into the business. I think it's been yeah. super helpful. I'm so glad. And I really, I appreciate so much your kind words. Um, you've always been kind of a voice of, of wisdom in this industry and camaraderie. So I really appreciate it. I hope that everyone gets something from this episode and um, thank you so much for having me on. You're so welcome. And Jacqueline, I'm going to have all of your social media posts. I'll have the link to this landing page and everything in show notes and people should be able to find you that okay, way. Okay. Perfect. Thank you so much. Okay. Thanks. Take have care. a good day. Jacqueline is so easy to talk to. I told her her voice is so calming. Um, I can sometimes get seriously hyped up and she just has a very calm effect on me. So maybe, maybe that's because we need it when we go to write these blogs, right? We need to be calm. So if you are feeling overwhelmed with the idea of blogging, be sure and start slowly and, and go out and download the editorial planning guide that Jacqueline made available for us on her website that's listed in the show notes. You can also head over to my website, scarletthreadconsulting.com, and check out some of the free resources I have to help make your business more profitable. There's a health checkup, a financial planning document. You can sign up for the newsletter. It's all there. So I really would just ask you to take advantage of the resources that are there that can help you and that are free. And as you do so, remember, profit doesn't happen by accident.